Okay, welcome to chapter six, supporting I.O. and storage devices. So we have to first talk about what I.O. is, and that's basic input output type devices and uh, storage devices. That could be mass storage, that could be long-term storage, short-term storage, things of that nature. Well, short-term storage is more memory. Mass storage is more like hard drive and optical drives and things that you're going to be keeping more than a few minutes. We want to talk about how to install these devices as well. I want to talk about some of the video subsystems and kind of how to select an appropriate monitor and video card as it relates to the 801 exam. Keep in mind, there are newer technologies out there that is not covered by the 801 exam. Things like 4K and ultra wide screens. Those are more for the updated exam, which will be the 901 when it comes out. So basic principles for supporting devices is every device is controlled by software. That software is typically called a driver. Uh, best guide for installation is double check with the manufacturer. Double check to see if the hardware that you're installing needs specific application software. For example, if you have a keyboard, mouse, and a gaming keyboard and mouse, sorry, uh, you may need to install the additional software to get the additional functionality of those additional buttons. So that's part of that software. A device is no faster than the port uh, that it's using. Normally to install additional hardware, you need a admin account because that's going to affect the overall system. And sometimes you can solve a lot of the issues by updating drivers and or firmware. Firmware is, again, dedicated software on the device itself, helping to run the device, and uh, only install one device at a time. That's kind of subjective, but that's a very common notion. So in Windows 7, if we're trying to install a printer, for example, uh, we may want to visit HP's website for this HP LaserJet P1006. Uh, if it says no driver found, we want to make sure that we navigate to the appropriate manufacturer and get the appropriate driver for our specific hardware. We also have an action center and device manager, and this helps to help solve a lot of our problems, or at least gives us a centralized area where we could start troubleshooting. Because this manage devices and the action center does provide a lot of detail on drivers, versions, things of that nature. And the action center also gives us a message detail so that we can get additional help trying to figure out how to solve some of these more common issues. Device manager can be uh, navigated to several different ways. You can right click on computer, go to properties. You can go to the run dialog box and type DEVMGMT. Dot msmc or msc that was that's one way to access the device manager only one way you can also start right click computer properties things of that uh, that method what's the purpose of device manager though it's made to first of all update or remove drivers you can update its drivers from that location you can install drivers you can undo a driver update because it does keep past drivers just in case, or you can enable or disable certain devices that you don't want to use. One way to use Device Manager to solve problems is we start looking for things that have like a, an exclamation mark or a yellow question mark, things that are standing out. For example, on my particular computer, I have an unknown security device for this Trusted platform module, see its little yellow explanation mark? That tells me, okay, there's an issue with this. We need to look into this. On my particular computer, I don't have that set up. That's why it's there. But things such as, let's find processors. For my processor, I have no question marks, no explanation marks, so we're good. If we actually double click on our on one of the uh, hardware items, we get a general tab. The device is working appropriately. We get location, manufacturer, what the device type is, what the unit is. We also have a driver tab that gives us the again, uh, again gives us the ability to look at driver details, 
update, rollback, disable, and uninstall. You'll happen to notice rollback and disable are completely uh, not usable at this point. That's because at this moment in time, I don't have previous drivers for this. It gives you the driver version and who signed the driver. With the details, it gives you uh, very specific details on your device. An event gives you particular types of events. So let's go ahead and let's look at my display adapter. This one is a manufacturer of for NVIDIA. It's a display adapter. I just updated my drivers back in beginning of uh, June. That's the uh, driver version. The uh, digital si uh, signature is from the H Windows hardware compatibility publisher. Even though I downloaded th these directly from NVIDIA, they were signed by Microsoft. Oh, but see, now you see that I have a rollback and a disable, because I can disable my video card. Details and events are still there. But I also have this new button called resources that gives us the resources for my particular device. It gives me my IRC, my input output range, my additional settings that I can use. If we're looking at a BIOS option, we also have the ability to flash BIOS depending on our motherboard, assuming it supports it. Common types of items found for add-ons for a motherboard are going to be things like eSATA, Wi-Fi, FireWire, or any variation of wireless. Things like Bluetooth or WiMAX, WiMAX uh, 802.11G or A or B or N or AC or things of that nature. Don't forget we also have things like Bluetooth and infrared. Big thing here is you kind of want to know speeds of common things and kind of general ranges. Like if it says FireWire 800, how far or how fast is it? Well, FireWire 800 is 800 megabits per second and it can go up to 100 meters. Let's get into some more of our USB type devices. USBs have different colors and different ports. Typically, if it's any color but blue, it's USB 2 or under. If the port itself is blue, it is USB 3. The fun part with all of this is USB comes in lots of different flavors. With USB, we can daisy chain up to 127 devices. USB is powered, so we have to be careful. The main USB that all of this is plugging into, we have to make sure it does not overload. So if we're trying to daisy chain a lot of USB devices that draw lots of power, we can burn out our USB ports. Common types of USB connectors could be a, a micro, could be a mini, could be a, an A to B cable, it could be a male A to micro A, it could be a micro A, a micro B, I mean, so many variations. So we have to be careful with USBs because it's not just USB 1. It's not just one type of USB. All right, moving on to FireWire. Normally used in new devices. That's kind of subjective. USB is way more common than FireWire. FireWire is very common if you have Mac products or high-end video equipment. But there are two different versions of the FireWire. The big ones are 800, 400. Very similar to USB, except the device count. Infrared could be things like our remote controls. That way we could have a multimedia controller that controls our device. That way it can turn it into like a, some type of home entertainment system. That's a common question, what IR remotes are used for. And again, turning our computer into a home entertainment system. How do we install peripherals? If we're looking at simple input output, Make sure that the ports are enabled through the BIOS. Read through the manufacturer's details. Make sure they have the uh, current drivers. Make sure that we have those ports enabled. Read the instructions and sell the software as required. Master keyboard, it could be a USB, could be a, uh, could be a PS2. 
Again, read the documentation. How to install a barcode reader? Same thing. But what is a barcode reader? A barcode reader is normally a device used to scan barcodes. Normally used on some type of point of sale type system. Could be wireless, could be serial, could be USB, could be lots of things. But again, how to install them? Install them based off the manufacturer's instructions. Most of this is plug and play. You plug it in, it works. But just in case, always double check manufacturer details so that you can make sure that you're installing everything as appropriate. We have biometric devices that allows us to capture physical characteristics. And that could be things like a fingerprint reader, a, a retina scan, palm printer, things of that nature. Normally with biometrics, read the documentation before you install. Okay, digital cameras could be a, a input-output device too. That can be the digital camera itself, if, if hooked up to the uh, computer via USB and it could also be a mass storage device because it may have a memory card. Most laptops do have a memory card reader just in case. We also have things like webcams. Uh, they capture uh, video or photos so that they can have a, a feed to the computer. Normally, if a webcam, it's a video. So you can do things like video conferencing or do recordings from your computer. That's what normally we use a webcam for. Pretty straightforward. They're USB. You install them. It installs the appropriate driver that they need, but this one normally does require additional software so you can get full functionality of your camera. You can also have things like a graphical tablet if you're doing things like Photoshop or drawing. This gives you a pen. This really does help because I'm using my mouse to draw and it does not always work well. We also have things like a MIDI or musical device we can add musical devices based off of what we need. These are kind of going away, slowly being replaced by USB because more and more audio equipment is coming standard with USB devices. We could have that done via USB, a USB with two additional mini uh, connectors. Again, it just kind of depends. Moving on could be a touch screen. That's always fun. We could have a monitor that is also a input device not just output, because you can touch the screen and you could then navigate based off of your touches. Smartphones, good example, a point of cell system or POS systems, good example. We normally have a touch screen that will connect via USB to our terminal or, or to our computer. Keyboard, video, and mouse switch. Keyboard, video, mouse. That allows us to hook up more than one computer uh, to one monitor, one keyboard, one mouse. That way, if you're doing a lot of working, you can just have a KVM and that will auto switch or switch based off of your needs. When we're installing, when we're prepping to install a adapter card, we have to follow a few basic steps. Do we have room? Do we have the appropriate drivers? Do we have a backup of data just in case? Where do we start? Normally we start by figuring out if that adapter card does work in our computer, if we have the room for it, if we have the drivers for it, things of that nature. So installing and configuring the adapter, go back to the documentation, go back to the manufacturer's material. You have to do it based off of them. It might talk about things like how to do where the grounding bracelet, if you do need it, if you don't need it. Definitely make sure the computer is shut down. Unplug insert, again, common ways to install devices. Follow the manufacturer's details. General directions to install. Make sure we can gain access to the system. Make sure we have the appropriate software. Uh, restart may be necessary if we're installing additional software. Again, follow the manufacturer's details though. Possible problems. At startup, could be whining, could be a black screen, could be error messages, could be instability. Normally, we make sure everything is up to date. Normally, if we hear whining sound, we try to track it down. Could be fans going out, could be a loose cable. So we do try. A uh, common thing, if you're not able to figure out what the problem is, you could always reseat cards. Basically, unplug it, plug it back in. You reseat as much as you can to see if it fixes it. 
And surprisingly, this does fix a lot of problems. When I say reseat things, and the reason I say that is because if we have a tower, our cards with gravity slowly get pulled out. So occasionally you may have to unplug them and put them back in in the same spot just to make sure they're nice, tight, and secure. We can install additional add-on cards, things like dedicated sound cards, based off of the appropriate drivers that we have. Here we have a Sound Blaster card. Well, we want to make sure that we go to Sound Blaster's website and download current drivers. We also have things like a TV tuner card that allows us to capture video off of coax. Again, we're installing software and drivers based off the manufacturer's requirements. Monitors. Monitors require two things. First, the physical monitor, and second, the actual video adapter or video card that will be displaying video to the monitor. Not all monitors are created equal, so you have to keep that in mind. Monitors come in different sizes, different shapes, different ports based off of our needs. Not just that, we have different types of monitors. Things like CRT, which is the old monitor, that's the fat ass ones that have a huge back. We have liquid display uh, crystals, that's another type. We have an LED uh, type monitor. We have a plasma monitor. We have all different types of monitors. So we have to make sure we understand the monitor technology that we're dealing with. Normally for the 801, you're not dealing with CRT. You're normally going to be dealing with an LCD or an LED. The big thing here is the LED backlight is used to light the LCD panel. Versus an LED one may not use a backlight. Monitor technology keeps changing. So you do want to do some research in the monitor technologies. So you understand the differences between LCD and LED and plasma, 4K and things of that nature. Let's look at details at our LCD panel. Our LCD panels are multiple layers. It's not a single layer. Each layer does a very specific item. It will be, have, be a, a light in the back that then lights up our different layers. But we have specific layers for specific things. We already talked kind of about plasma. We also have projectors. We have uh, different types of LED. Again, this technology is constantly changing, so we got to be careful. All right, key things that you definitely want to know are things like size screen, refresh rate, pixel density, resolution, as opposed to native resolution, the contrast ratio, viewing angle, backlight, connectors. All of these are key things because with display technology, viewing angle, that's going to be the angle that we can view the monitor so we can know kind of where to place it. Contrast ratio is going to deal with the ratio for contrast. Resolution is going to be the actual display resolution. Uh, and the, how many pixels per inch, things of that nature. Our video cards normally are going to be PCI Express. That's the newest technology out. AGP and PCI are kind of old, dead technologies. We have the different types of cables, VGA and DVI. DVI actually has very specific types. We have a DVI-D, DVI-I, and DVI-A. So DVI typically is a digital cable, but if we're dealing with a DVI-A, that's only transmitting analog data. If we're dealing with a DVD or DVI-D, we're dealing with only digital data. So we gotta be careful and we have to know the differences between the different display connectors, VGA and all of the sub DVIs. We also have component, composite, and S video. Though these are kind of dead, like five, 15, 10 years ago, these might have been important. But a lot of these are going away. HDMI, DisplayPort, those things are taking a hold. Oh, I got ahead of myself. DisplayPort and HDMI are the newer technologies. Here's what our DisplayPort looks like. Full size and mini. And this is what our HDMI looks for. Both full size and mini. Monitor buttons, 
Uh, buttons on our monitor can change the rotation of the screen, the contrast, the color, the input. So we kind of have to know what we're using. Since we're dealing with video, we also have to talk about the video card. And that's going to be comprised of a GPU, or sometimes it's called a visual processing unit, or VPU. More often than not, it's graphic processing unit, not just VPU. It also has its own dedicated memory, which you'll notice will be GDDR. Uh, computers nowadays, common ones, is DDR4. So why do we have a graphic DDR5 if our PC uses DDR4? Because our video card requires faster video, hence the GDDR. Not just DDR, but graphical DDR. Normally, the more based off of your needs, but more memory on a video card, the better. It also kind of goes back to what you're using it for, but more is always better for video cards when it comes to memory, as long as it fits within your budget. Windows 7 it has Arrow, and there are specific requirements. PCs nowadays, they should at least meet these requirements. Video can be based off of processor chip, not just dedicated video cards. Intel has a built on video on the processor, where Intel Xeons do not. Okay, that's enough about video. Let's talk about storage. Storage normally is three categories. Mass storage or long-term storage, optical storage, or some type of solid state storage. I know they can also include things like optical disks, flash drives, and memory cards, but all of them fit within a specific type of storage. First thing we have to realize is within our file systems, sorry, within our storage, we have to have a file system, the way to organize our storage. And normally, if we're dealing with Windows, we're dealing with things like NTFS or FAT. Common things with these types of file systems is uh, compatibility. Let's say you have a flash drive and you want to be able to copy data from your computer and your Xbox and your PlayStation. Well, NTFS only allows Windows-based devices or Microsoft-supported devices to copy data to them. So your PlayStation would not be able to copy data to your flash drive if it's formatted in TFS, uh, where XFAT would. But limitations, if you're trying to copy a 5 or 10 gig file to your flash drive, your FAT will not support that large of a file, where NTFS does. So there's give and take between both of them. I've already done videos on both of these, so if you want to know more about them, check out those videos. We have a 4 gig SSD card using FAT32, and that will work. Because again, you're not going to copy a 4 gig file to this 4 gig SSD card. Uh, first of all, FAT doesn't support it, but also there's no real room. We have our standards for optical. Uh, things like CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays. Our CDs use a specific file format called a compact disk file system, or CDFS. Our Blu-rays and DVDs use a universal disk format. That way, they can be read on any type of reader. However, we got to be careful here, because people go, well, if they have the same format, why can't I have a Blu-ray uh, read in a DVD player? The DVDs and Blu-rays actually have different colored lasers that read the disc. A Blu-ray has a blue laser. And so you can only have a blue laser reading that Blu-ray. A DVD has a red laser. So while the, the data stored on them is in the same file format, the actual reading mechanism, the laser that reads them, is slightly different. The data that we could be uh, written to, these are general, but you can have like a 700 meg a CD, you could have a, a 4.5 gig DVD. If we double side it, or if we do a multi-layer, we're gonna have additional storage. When it comes to single-sided, that means just one side is written to, and the layers. 
The layer is, we can write it one layer deep or two layer deep. And so we can actually put twice the amount of data on a single side disk if we write both layers. We could have that increased if we do, uh, write on both sides and both sides two layers deep. Blu-ray, again, is a lot larger and Blu-ray also has double-sided with dual layers as well. We also have this nice little feature that a lot of people no longer use or really talk about. It's called LightScribe. It allows you to print directly on your optical disk. That way, you can have it all nice and neat and organized and formatted the way that you want it. Don't have to worry about your crappy handwriting. All right, how do we install these? Normally, they're going to be SATA. We First of all, make sure we have to have room. We have a spare SATA connection. We have the appropriate power. And we put it in the case based off of the uh, case or the case of chassis manufacturer. Basically, do we go in from the front? Do we go in from the back? You're not going to know until you read about the case manufacturer and how they recommend you install a five and a quarter type device. Normally, they're being installed from the front. You push it in through the front and it will lock. You pull again both data and power to verify that the device works. Power powers it. The SATA cable gives the data connection so that the motherboard can actually talk to it. It has to have both. Let's talk about long-term storage. That could become in form of like an SSD hard drive or maybe even things like a memory card or USB flash drive. Again, they're going to be uh, formatted based off of your needs. And our memory cards are going to be different types of memory cards based off, again, what we need. Uh, is it an SD card? Is it a high capacity SD card? Is it an extended capacity uh, SD card? There are so many different types of SD cards, whether it be a micro or a mini or a full size, different manufacturers, different types. Like these are just the SD brand type memory cards. That's not talking flash memory or anything like that. We also have additional solid state storage. If we're using these memory cards as storage, we could format them based off the appropriate file formats as we were as we need. We have things like uh, our memory sticks, our XD sticks, our flash memory. Again, all of these are different types. We did not discuss SSD in the form of long-term mass storage like a hard drive. That's coming in another chapter. And that's actually it for this chapter.